Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from CA Tranquility. We've got a special show here today and a very special guest. I'd like to welcome Martin Popoff from Canada. He's the uh, one of the founding members of Ray Words and Bully Knuckles. He's uh, also a star of Banger TV and an acclaimed author who's had a ton of books to his credit that he's put out over the year or the years, I should say. And today we're going to specifically talk about one of his brand new books, which I just received. Um, can't wait to get into it. And he is no stranger to writing about this particular band. We're talking about Anthem, Rush in the 70s. I mean, look at this beautiful book. I mean, Martin, this is like, you know, this has got some, uh, first of all, welcome to the show before we get yes, into the thank book. You, so thank you. How are no, you doing? It's really cool being here. I'm, I'm doing great. Yeah, doing, uh, doing a lot of, you know, in this virus times, I'm still, mail order is not broken. So I'm doing a lot of mail order. I'm, I'm kind of working, doing the same thing. And, and you know what it's like. We can do, we can do all this talking about our favorite bands from home, right? Talking about them, writing about them, whatever, right? That, that's yeah that's what we do all the time right yeah. so absolutely so i i just want to say that uh martin and i have been kind of uh we've, we've been communicating on and off for many many years and we've done little little bits of things together over the years because you know and martin was like fully into the brave words and bloody knuckles thing and see a tranquility was kind of getting its start uh back in the late 90s early 2000s uh you know he and i always kind of shared some conversation and occasionally martin would throw us a little bit of something that didn't really work for brave words and what have you uh, but Martin, more importantly, has uh, long been a supporter of what we do here at Sea Tranquility and vice versa. And I have reviewed many of Martin's books over the years uh, here on the YouTube show, as well as on the web scene. And I've long wanted to have him on the show. And as soon as I like ordered this from him a couple weeks ago and got it in, I was like, you know what? I think it's time to get Martin here on the show talking about this book because we have a lot of Rush fans on this channel. A lot of Rush fans. And I think that, uh, well, first of all, so... Let's back it up a little bit. So this is not your first go around with Rush. You've got uh, a handful of books that you've done on Rush. Maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the previous volumes, and then we'll kind of work our way up to this one here. Yeah, so so the first book was one of my earliest books, Contents Under Pressure. It was an authorized Rush biography, but it was full color throughout, 66,000 words, which is not that big a book, but came out long, long time ago, and it was really successful for ECW. Like I say, it was authorized. It was done in you know cooperation with the office and did a bunch of interviews directly with the guys for it. And then I thought I was done. I can't do any more Rush books. And then Voyager Press came along and I was doing lots and lots of projects for those guys. And they had a series called uh, The Illustrated Histories. And I was able to do another book for them because I used no outside uh, press in the, in the first one. So I thought, okay, they, they do this thing where they have uh, reviews by, by famous journalists for, um, you know, for on, on the albums. Plus, I was able to use a lot of outside press. Plus, it was the story of the band in 35,000 words, so even shorter, right? <laughs> then um, we had a series going uh, called uh, Album by Album. And for that, I did a Pink Floyd, a Rush, a ACDC, an Iron Maiden, a Queen. I think that's it, five of them. Uh, anyway, so, so that, again, was basically uh, interviewing people. You know, we're trying trying to get sort of celebrities on. So I had Kirk Hammett in that one. He was one of the guys talking to. So it's just a QA and a of, of every studio album. So that was totally different. I thought, okay, now I'm for sure done with Rush, right? Um, but then this came along that I was working on on the movie Beyond the Light of Stage with Banger, right? And I, you know, I was in early on full time for nine months there at the office at the research phase, but then also doing a lot of transcribing. And we had tons and tons and tons of stuff that we didn't use for the movie. So just, you know, one time at the Banger barbecue party, I was thinking, ah, let's just see if we, we could swing a little deal to use that stuff, and then maybe I'll go off and self-publish a Rush book. But what happened was, basically, uh, with, you know, in conjunction with ECW, which again is uh, the official publisher of the first one, plus Neil's, Neil Peart's books, um, we basically did a, did a deal to, uh, to, to do this. And we were going to do the mother of all Rush books. But as soon as I started writing it, I realized I had enough for three books. And so we're literally got this one, Anthem Rush in the 70s, uh, October 2020. We've got Limelight Rush in the 80s. And then uh, spring exactly this time next year, there's Driven Rush in the 90s and in the end. Each of them like 125,000 words each. So... It was, it was a conjunction of being kind of like the, the update on steroids of the original contents under pressure with all this new material, 
We're throwing everything at the kitchen sink at it, including a lot more analysis, uh, which is something I kind of learned from doing the Led Zeppelin, all the albums, all the songs, and the Clash, all the albums, all the songs, where I had to just write about every single song for 400, 500 words, threw a bit of that at the rush as well. And there you have it. So, so we have a trilogy and a super, super long, big, thick trilogy. And safe to say, even if you have the others, you'll want this one as well. Yeah, of course, there'll be no overlap in the trilogy because they are, they are a chronological trilogy. So. Right. So I've read a good chunk of your by decade or by era books. And I personally like that, that formula. And I think uh, a lot of people, because, you know, you have fans out there who are like, well, I love Rush, but I only listen to the 70s albums. Well, you know what? Here's a volume just for you. And then you got the folks who are like, well, I really really loved Rush in the 80s. That's what I prefer. They're going to have that volume for, for them. So, and I think that that has really paid off like, uh, you know, the Priest ones and the Sabbath ones. I mean, they all kind of fall into the same type of uh, thing. And if, if you really prefer one era over another, or if you like it all, it's a way to really kind of dive in, in depth to each of those particular eras. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I think Martin and I are either we're just really old school or, or we're kindred spirits is like we kind of look at bands by the albums and by the songs. And I think like that's like on all the and, you know, here you have two guys who probably have written more reviews of albums than anybody else on the planet. I know Martin's got me beat by a few thousand, but uh, that's kind of the way I, I don't know. Maybe you want to speak on this a little bit. But that's kind of the way I always look at bands and music. It's like, you know what? The, it's the albums and the songs. And when you're going to talk about a band, you have to talk about those two things. Maybe you want to kind of touch on that a little bit because that really makes up kind of what's so great about your books. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And just to clarify something, I realized you meant uh, overlap. You were talking about the other books. So yeah, there, there is no overlap also with, you know, that rush album by album was a strange, totally different beast from, the illustrated history, which is right. a coffee table book throughout. But this is this has overlap with the original contents under pressure, which is long out of print. So this is like the the greatly expanded, as I was saying, that one's sixty six thousand words. This one just on the seventies is is hundred and twenty five thousand. So I think that's what you meant before. But yeah, right. you're right. I mean I I am um, with these rock books, I mean I read a lot of rock books too. And I, I hate when I get to the spot where they're talking about my favorite album and it's over in a page and a half and we're back Absolutely. to Back to what it's like on the road in Paris or, uh, you know, or, you know, in France. And we went to and we took vacation to Africa and all this stuff. Right. I want to know about the albums and the songs. So that's why, you know, I, I'm starting to have this formula across all these books where I want to make sure I talk about the, the writing, the recording, the mixing, the album cover, who's the producer. So there's a lot of interviews with producers uh, throughout this whole rush thing. Which to uh, the music you know, geeks and the music nerds, that's really important, right? Yeah, and and that guy that guy is is literally for what we love the most, uh, you know, the records. That guy is as important as any one band member generally on on a session on and on a putting together of an album. So so yeah, the lyrics, the songs, that you know, the production, all the arrangements, what they put in. So so yeah, this book uh, and pretty much everything I do is is like a chapter per album. You know, we, we dispense with touring and all that stuff pretty fast. I'm not a big live album guy. I'm not a big live concert guy. If I've seen a band three or four times, never need to see them again, basically. <laughs> uh, um, that's a whole nother story. But, uh, but basically, um, yeah, I, I want to talk about the records in as much detail as possible. Definitely drop down on every single song. So in regards to this book, without giving too, too much away for people who have not uh, read it yet, which were your favorite albums to really kind of go into here from this period? Yeah, I guess my favorite albums would be what are my favorite albums too, which is uh, which is a, a fair question. And I would say in this book, um, you know, I'd be looking at uh, I'd be looking at a farewell to Kings and Hemispheres, and probably Hemispheres the most. I feel I feel that's the record where they got the best sound. Twenty One Twelve's got amazing production too. I'm, I'm quite. Yeah. You know, for 1976, that's a really well-produced album. But but I thought it got a little thin, uh, a little little toppy, and not much bottom end on a farewell to Kings. And then the guitars were back on Hemispheres. But you know, at that time we were we were young, angry metalheads. You know, I was I was 14 in '77, and uh, and and you know, we only loved heavy stuff. So we were actually, as me and my buddies, were a little ticked off at Rush or a farewell to Kings, and even still somewhat for Hemispheres. It was guitars throughout, 
but it was definitely Prague written, right? I mean, it was essentially, you know, I, I, I basically consider Rush the inventors of progressive heavy metal or progressive metal. And literally, it's just like cramming the two things together. It's literally, I, I think it's like, Progressive rock with a distortion pedal on it. That's essentially what Rush is. Yeah, um, I mean, you're not far off. And I think, yeah. like, for me, I've never been a big lyric guy. I was always more for the music. But Rush was one of the first bands where I actually really wanted to sit down and read those lyrics. Yeah. Because they were, you know, it's like sci-fi lyrics. It's like, I mean, nobody was writing songs like Rush was at the time. And I yeah. think that for me, that was the first time I really wanted to say, hey, you know what, instead of just putting this record on and just sitting over there and getting into it, I'm actually going to sit there with the LP and look at the and read the lyrics along with it. I never did that before. I don't know how much I've done that since either. Yeah. And it's conceptual and there's all this stuff to, you know, references to uh, literature and stuff, which you're doing in high school anyways, right? You're seeing yeah. this stuff and you're actually making some connections. You're kind of blown away that you're seeing some things that you're, you're actually covering in high school or whatever. So yeah, that's really cool. And it's all coming from the drummer, which is, which is pretty cool too. Absolutely. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, it's, this is a, this is a strange debate and I'm sure, I'm sure Neil, you know, rest in peace. Um, you know, he, he was a guy who, who really, um, you know, quickly dispensed with his early stuff and was a little embarrassed by it. And and there is kind of a point there. You grow up over time. You grow up lyrically through the 80s with Rush, and and Neil grows even more through the 90s and the 2000s with Rush. And you look back on that, and you might think there's an element of that word juvenilia to it, right? Um, but, you know, it, essentially, um, what I love about it is if you're the only ones doing this and trying really hard and delivering this stuff, because there's not a lot of bands doing it, then it is really unique and refreshing and cool to have this stuff um, referencing, uh, you know, um, literature and sci-fi and being conceptual and all that. But yeah, sure. I mean, I, I guess there is an element of most of these things he's talking about are possibly the things that might appeal to a, a young, a younger male who is intellectually inquisitive, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could say that. Um... So I just wanted to kind of show everybody here because normally in Martin's books, we've got, you know, it's obviously a lot of text and Martin talked about that, but then you've got uh, a couple sections here with some pretty cool photographs from the archives, which I think is always a great thing for fans to see. You've got two sections in here with some really cool vintage photographs. And as far as the page count, uh, looks like uh, 354. So a good size book. Yeah. And, uh, That's nice funny. Hardback. You're right. I mean, I never really thought of this, but all three of the previous Rush books are essentially coffee table books. They're all full color throughout. This is this is the the reading book. This is the the slow food. Uh, you know, the the um, basically all all you wanted to know about Rush in words will will be here. That was kind of the idea across all all three of them. Like, I want this to be you know the quintessential Rush book because every Rush book, mine and other people's included, and there's some great Rush books, right? Chemistry and Merely Players. They they all they all do things quite differently from each other. So this is the first one that's that's like a truly just like a a a you know as they say trade paper trade paperback but no this is a hardcover but the idea of of being lots of words and just like you say some ticked in color sections and what's the easiest way for folks to get a copy of this right now um uh, martinpopoff.com i mean basically my my business uh, all year every year is, you know is more so a mail order guy of my own book so anything that i have uh that anything that is in print i have at my office here in toronto and uh, there's PayPal buttons there for US, international, Canada, full descriptions of the books. I sign every book that, that I ship out of the office. So yeah, martinpopoff.com for basically any book of mine that's uh, in print. Yeah, and I will say from experience, very easy to order from Martin. I usually, you know, it's two seconds to place the order through PayPal. And then within like a week, week and a half, I usually have my copy. So uh, nicely packaged and everything. So very cool. Well, I'm sure everybody's going to be looking forward to reading this. Like I said, I know we have a lot of Rush fans. Martin, if you got a couple minutes, I do want to kind of stay on the Rush topic a little bit uh, as they're kind of in the news again. So we've got the Permanent Waves uh, 40th anniversary coming out. Uh, your thoughts on that? Have you heard anything from it? Have you seen kind of what's going to be included in that uh, reissue? Yeah, I've seen I've seen what's included and I've seen the past reissues and, and they put a lot of stuff into these reissues. And this is a great great record to be reissued it's it's one of my favorite rush albums funny thing about it it's a really short album it's like it 35 36 minutes or something right yeah 
but but it is a really cool album. I mean, the you know the narrative on on Rush and, and that we kind of you know pushed in the movie a fair bit, and it's it's kind of stuck is that they you know, the spirit of radio kind of like changed their heads around to to write shorter songs or whatever. I don't think Permanent Waves is much different really from Hemispheres or Farewell to Kings. It's or really not. Or, no, I mean, it's it's just as complicated. It's got tons of long songs, um, but, uh, and, and even the next record, they have long songs as well. So, I mean, it, it takes them a while to really make that transition. But no, I think it's just as proggy and just as tricky as the other stuff. Now, now what's in it, everything is in it that, that you would want in it. But one of the frustrating things with Rush reissues is that um, they, do, they have no extra songs. They have, no, they have nothing. They basically work on everything and it all ends up on the album. We found that out with the movie. I mean, essentially there's the, there's the very early material that never made records. There's, there's three, four, five of those. But other than that, um, there was just nothing all along the way. So you're, you're not going to get much in the way of, uh, you know, cool extra sonic uh, audio on it. Yeah, and it's, that's a very good point. And uh, I, I just reached over to grab something that I just picked up. So I just, I don't know how much of a Jethro Tull fan you are, but I just recently picked this up. <laughs> and Jethro Tull is a, is a band who over the years have always recorded extra stuff at all these album sessions that didn't make the albums that eventually would show up in either greatest hits compilations or on future reissues as bonus tracks and all this kind of stuff. Well, I thought I had like everything that Jethro Tull had ever recorded and released. And then I get this and there's tunes on here recorded from those sessions that they never released before that are as good as anything on the album. It's like, yeah, why don't more bands do that? Right. So, but, yeah. but, you know, I think going back to the rush reissue, I think for most, cause I've, I, I can't tell you how many different reissues I've bought of rush albums over the years. Right. But I think for those live shows that they attach on these, these recent reissues, that's the reason to get them. Right. Yeah. That's pretty cool too. And yeah. I think that probably frustrates a lot of fans who, you know, I don't want permanent waves again. I already have, two versions of it already but i want that live album right and it's yeah, like and yeah. probably the frustration of not being able to get that separately on its own yeah it's funny you know you you mentioned this the extra songs thing a, a band that has, is in a weird weird space with this is the rolling stones i mean i i've been listening to a lot of stones lately and uh and and thinking oh i, I wish i could get these expanded reissues with all these extra songs they must have extra songs i don't know much about extra rolling stone songs right and there and and then you find out you can't get a lot of really cool expanded reissues but go on youtube you can listen to you can listen to unreleased stones for hours and hours and then i got this great book i'm looking at it across the room here the rolling stones all the songs it's like a 1200 page book Wow, and, and that is that is a great exploration of of basically all this stuff so stones and Aerosmith's another one that is sort of in the same camp as Stones. You could go on YouTube and play tons and tons and tons of Aerosmith stuff that is, that is you know, not even officially released on box sets or anything like that. Um, so yeah, YouTube's a great resource for, uh, for some of this stuff, but I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, Stones essentially along all those years, there's, there's practically an extra album's worth of material all along the way. And you'd think there'd be five or more, right? Yeah. With all that history, yeah. So... Right. So I want to go back to a point you made earlier on about being a young metal head and like, you know, the mid late seventies and all of a sudden Rush's music starting to get a little bit more accessible. What were your thoughts on Rush, their music and the band say around 84, 85 as Grace Under Pressure and Power Windows, so on and so forth are coming out. Are you still as, as big a fan then or did your interest in the band wane a little bit during that decade? Definitely not. I've never come back to those records and become more of a fan, especially Hold Your Fire. Uh, but I mean, Hold Your Fire, Presto, Roll the Bones, that whole bunch in there, I'm, I'm still not that big a fan of. So it's, you know, it's a little more painful writing those, those uh, chapters in the later books. But I, I think, I think the productions didn't, uh, didn't live on well. They didn't, they didn't, you know, time out nicely. Um, the, the toppy bass, the electronic drums, um, you know, some of the writing, the playing, I mean, I, I don't, I, I just never became that much of a fan, but being such a huge Rush fan, I find, I find this happens with, um, uh, with catalogs where you don't like the later catalogs, but you're such a huge fan. You usually allow them one or two or three more that you, that you normally wouldn't perhaps, uh, if you were sticking to your narrative. So Signals happens to be my favorite Rush album of all time. Wow, and uh, so so I'm I'm loving them into this transition into the keyboards, but I'm loving the 
the warm early keyboard sound with still, you know, the stadium rock drumming and, and the pretty, you know, rich, warm sounding Alex guitars. And I like Grace, Grace Under Pressure a lot. I, I think that's a really cool album. But Power Windows is where it starts to go down for me. And then Hold Your Fire, certainly, I'm, I'm still not, not a big fan of. I, I had a big argument about this with, uh, with Mitch LaFon. Anytime we talk about Def Leppard, we get into a big, uh, because I hate hysteria and I don't think Mutt Lang's productions have aged particularly well either. But, um, but no, I think Rush, the problem with Rush is um, they're so intellectually curious and chasers of trends. You know that idea in the computer industry, uh, you're, you're, a, you're a first adapter of something. So Rush was a first adapter of many things along the way. And sometimes it paid off in spades. Like if, um, like when they started getting into video and then, and then basically, eventually people don't really talk about them this way, but they were one of the most advanced bands technologically when it came to their live show, uh, you know, in, uh, in interspersing video with what they were doing and all sorts of doodads. I mean, people talk about Kiss having a huge show. Rush's show was routinely way more elaborate than Kiss's show. Hell yeah. Right? <laughs> yep, Rush had yep. a massive, massive stage show and people, <clears throat> people kind of forget that, right? But so, so yeah, Getty, Getty as a first adopter uh, or adapter of keyboard technology, you know, tr uh, creeping into moving pictures and all over signals, I loved what he was doing. But you can, also, you can also be early and use stuff that doesn't age well. And I think that's exactly what happened, both at the drum end and the and the wall bass and the and the keyboard stuff that those you know, stabbing synth sounds and everything in the eighties. So sometimes, like you're never going to know whether this stuff is going to age well or not, and and you're also never going to know if it comes around again and becomes totally cool. Like like Rush in the seventies came around again and became totally cool, right? Yeah. So yeah, you know, time will still tell, but uh, but I don't think that stuff particularly has aged well. Would it have aged better? if we heard a little more Alex on those albums, because that's, that was the issue that I had with a lot of those albums back in the day. And still to this day, uh, I just think that it, Alex's guitar tones were kind of flat and it was missing some meat from him as where, as all the other albums had. And granted, I know it's the eighties music was changing and all that kind of stuff. And Alex was playing some of his best guitar work on those albums. Yet the riffs were just kind of like, not really there. Like yeah. we remembered them. Yeah. And like you said, all the synths and the, and the different sounding drums and what have you kind of overtook the music. And for some of us who were with the band from the beginning, that was kind of too much of a drastic change. And uh, so I, yeah. I totally agree with you there. Yeah, I mean, Alex, you know, number one, there there is a there is a little bit of, uh, you know, polite Canadian friction between Getty and Alex and Neil on on, you know, the lack of Alex. I mean, that really starts coming in with with signals where he starts really being concerned about it. But it's almost like Alex comes around and gets swept up in the enthusiasm of Getty and Neil and decides to kind of play along with this idea. So he he's all about the fix and in XX or in XS and the police and all these sorts of bands where where the guitar see, he always had the mind space uh, more or less of uh, loving to be a colorist and a texturist uh, as he goes goes along there, right? Um, but he got even even more so that way on those records. So he was he was basically trying to be a modern, and you know the, the Miami Vice suits and all that stuff, right? I mean, basically they're all on the same page. So it's not even really his tone, but it's it's completely his mind space of of just you know loving to to stab in and be texturally going back and forth and adding adding color and shade and you know chiming and all this kind of stuff, right? The Fix is the band that really comes to mind when I think of this stuff. Actually, and In Excess, like I say. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, it, the songs were just not made for that. Um, so he is a problem, but I, I think the bigger problem really is it's all of it. It's, it's the songwriting. It's the keyboards. It's, it's Peter Collins as a producer. You know, he, he, is a he is an assured man. He is sure of what he wants to do. He's Mr. Big. He's coming in. They want him in because they love all this thin English pop that he made, very deliberately so, for, for UK market, for UK, the UK market and for UK radio, right? Um, that's what they wanted out of them. That's what they got. So they were all working in concert to come up with this really austere, strange 80s sound. Yeah. Which, let's be frank, worked for a lot of listeners. And one of the things that I found in doing the show over the years, anytime the topic of Rush comes about, specifically that era, 
there's a lot of big fans of those albums. And I, you know, it, it, I did a, it was probably about a year ago. I did a show where I talked about uh, stinker albums from bands you love. Right. And one of the albums I mentioned was hold your fire. And then I specifically talked about how I was not a big fan of power windows, hold your fire and presto specifically those three, because I do like race under pressure a lot. And I've liked that more as time has gone on. And you know, a lot of people were like, I can't believe you don't like this, those albums. So what I did was I went back and I made a, a conscious effort to go back and re-listen to those albums again ad nauseum to see what am I missing, you know, that everybody seems to love that I didn't like at the time and I haven't liked in recent years. And you know what? Those albums started to kind of warm up to me a little bit more, specifically Power Windows. I still think Hold Your Fire and Presto are fairly weak albums in my opinion but there are good songs on there uh, i maybe don't love the production or the the arrangements or what have you but i can see the appeal and it just it's interesting that you have fans who kind of come into a band at a specific time so yeah. folks who yeah. maybe are a little bit younger than you or i who didn't start listening to rush till maybe uh, you know moving pictures or signals or what have you those albums are perfectly fine but for the uh, thus uh, us who have been with the band since the beginning or the mid 70s or what have you i mean that was kind of like that was like a big stretch i know for me at the time speaking as a uh you know a 20 or 22 year old i was like whoa this is not the rush that i know and love i'm not sure if i like this but yeah. again i think my point is that uh i've really tried to go back and kind of find what everybody loves about those albums and i can see it i'm, I'm not i still will never say that they're necessarily my go-to rush albums but I can kind of understand the appeal of power windows and hold your fire and presto. And, you know, and then you've got the nineties, which we haven't even gotten into here. That's a whole other thing, but I, I like a lot of the music from the nineties from the band and, you know, up till yeah. the last couple, but there are people who don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you bring that up. I mean, I, I did these books, uh, riff raff, the top 250 heavy metal songs of the seventies and songs of the eighties, uh, aces high. And then earlier on, also through ECW, we did big poll where we did the top 500 heavy metal albums of all time. So I'm 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 kind of updating these things as I go along, and I I ask the poll once in a while, and and I have found that um, basically there's a ton of people. Well, put it this way, Painkiller often wins the poll for the greatest Judas Priest album, 1990, right? Uh, Heaven and Hell often wins the poll as the greatest Black Sabbath album. Ozzy isn't even on it, right? Right. So right. this this happens a lot, and people will just defend the Tony Martin years of Black Sabbath to the death, right? So yeah, it definitely matters where you come in with a band. That magic moment when you're 16, 17 years old and you get your first albums, you know, and and you know if everything around you is is 80s synth pop and you get Power Windows and you're and you're a semi heavy guy or whatever and you're 16 years old at that time, sure that could be your favorite Rush album forever, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but you're right. 90s, I mean, just briefly, I, I love that the guitars came back. I love Counterpart. I love Vapor Trails and, and the last one quite a bit as well. So, um, Clockwork Angels, uh, basically, um, I, you know, I, I went through this with the Ted Nugent. This is, this is a bit of a tangent, but the Ted Nugent book, I loved writing so much because even though I, I fell off for most of the 80s and I, I really don't like Spirit of the Wild and I argue with people about all these 80s albums, I will argue to the death that Crave Man and Love Grenade and even Shut Up and Jam are three of his greatest albums of all time, which is just a bizarre view for almost <laughs> any Nugent fan. But because of that, I almost felt like I had the creative license as a super fan to, uh, to, to say the Nugent album and... Uh, and uh, you know, uh, if you can't lick them, and and some of these were horrible. I, I don't even like intensities in ten cities, right? So I, I felt like I had this license to say this because I am the craziest Ted Nugent fan of all time, who thinks three of his greatest albums are are three of the last four. The last one, no, he it's too short, it's too jokey, it's he's covering himself, he's right rewriting Cat Scratch Fever. It's it's kind of like a phoned in EP almost, right? But those three in a row to me are like sacrosanct. They're amazing. I play them all the time. 
doesn't it feel good to be like a lifelong fan of a band or artist and to actually say that about a band who's been around for 45 or 50 years yeah. to say, so, I mean, I've been saying that about like Uriah Heap and Deep Purple for years. Exactly. I mean, yeah, right? right. I mean, it's yeah. like, but there are people like, Oh, I haven't listened to anything past machine head. I'm like, well, why aren't you like what give these albums a chance? And it's like, and I've been saying for years that some of the, you know, and those are just three examples. Yeah. I'm sure there's more. Cheap I can't trick, wait to hear motorhead, more. cheap trick, motorhead, uh, kiss even, doesn't work with Aerosmith. I don't Saxon. think it's I mean, Saxon. Yeah, I mean, Saxon. Saxon. Yeah, doesn't work with Scorpions particularly. I don't think the magic kind of doesn't feel like it's there. Definitely Aerosmith's a, a bad one. Def Leppard's not a good one. But uh, but you're right. I mean, two of the greatest examples you mentioned right off the top. Deep and Deep Purple. My God. I mean, favorite albums wise, uh, definitely. I, I, put, I put Steve Morse albums in my favorite Deep Purple albums. Um, although Perfect Strangers is my favorite. Keep, keep, same thing. They're all just solid, right? I mean, really great good. examples. Yeah. We can only hope the best for Blue Oyster Cult's album that's coming up, right? Yeah, absolutely. That would be <laughs> <laughs> I am anxiously awaiting that. So uh... I love Heaven Forbid. I mean, I love everything Blue Oyster Cult ever did. I don't think absolutely. they really... Well, Club Ninja, eh, maybe not, but I mean, I, I thought they came back pretty strong. However, yeah. Club Ninja is actually better than you remember it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I made well, that point on a recent show. It's actually not that bad. Right. I did play it again recently. Yeah. You are the wise swami of classic rock. You <laughs> Before we go, I do want to mention one more thing because you brought up Tony Martin era Black Sabbath and that how so many people now hold that era so highly. My comment is that era in Black Sabbath is only really good, but why is it that everybody's coming out now claiming how great it was, but yet nobody supported the band or bought those albums back in the day? You, you realize yeah, that? That's true, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, and, and some of those, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of good material across all of them. One thing that I always will argue to the death is that, is that it almost seemed like almost by a, a fate or coincidence, all the best songs wound up on Eternal Idol. I mean, I think that album start to finish, I cannot believe how great that album was. And to me, it was kind of downhill from there. For some reason, a lot of people love Headless Cross a lot. I, I find the I do. I'm a big fan. Cool. Yeah. I, I hate the production. I think it's a bad Cozy Powell performance too. Um, but, but Eternal Idol is just drop dead classic. The songs on that, I mean, they should have been a massive, massive band again because of that. Just the hooks and the heaviness combined on that album are just incredible, I think. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I totally agree. Well, Martin, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, I'd love to have you back if you're up for it. So oh, can... any anytime, anytime. We can talk about whatever. I don't care if it's a, has, it is linked to a book I have or anything like that. I'll, I'll come talk to you about whatever. Sounds good. We're going we're gonna to do that. So again, everybody, remember the new, al the new album, the new book is called Anthem, Rush in the 70s on uh, ECW Press. Go over to Martin's uh, website. You can order yourself a copy. And uh, while you're doing that, visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Thanks again to Martin Popoff. We will, hopefully will be seeing him again. And uh, everybody have a great rest of your Monday. For those here in the United States, enjoy your Memorial Day. And uh, we'll see you later on. Take care. Martin, thanks again. Yes, thank you, Pete.